Beer with Buffy is a retro analytical love roast of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. If you'd like to support our show financially, you can find us on patreon.com slash beerwithbuffy. Don't forget to review us on iTunes if you like what you hear. I was told you were coming. The competition is a beautiful thing. We're Slayer's girlfriend, the chosen two. Why should we let him take all the Gosh, I'm feeling chipper. <laughs> Who's for a root beer? Jeez. I don't like vampires. I'll take a stand and say they're not good. Fucking fantastic. I love that sound. Uh, the ice cream bar is this way. Welcome to Beer with Buffy. I'm Josh. I'm Rex. You can find us on www.patreon.com forward slash beer with Buffy. And we always love getting reviews on iTunes. That's the number one way you can help us out. If you're willing and able, please do that. Hey, Rex. Hey, what? Do ingest a satchel of Richards. <laughs> Wasn't that just perfect? That's what you get for sending me memes just before we record. But yes, yes it was. I enjoyed that meme. Yeah. A satchel of Richards. Pooh Bear getting progressively more more fancy about his insults. That's how Giles would he, say it. Uh, do ingest a, a satchel of Richards. Exactly. But Giles, what does that mean? Anyway. <laughs> I thought it might be fun to mention real quick. Like, I've been spouting off on social media a little bit about it, but... So I've been watching The Chilling Adventures of Sabrina recently. I just couldn't get into it. Yeah, me either. Uh, well, uh, so it has its ups and downs, but I just wanted to bring it up. I'm not going to go into detail about Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. I for the most part, don't. And I just want to say it's really, really, really making me appreciate Buffy the Vampire Slayer because it's so easy to take for granted the amount of chemistry that all of the characters in Buffy the Vampire Slayer have with one another. Yes. And that is one of the main problems in Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. Everything feels so fucking mechanical and... Also, another thing we take for granted is how much Buffy is written like a real fucking person and not a tool for a soapbox. Yeah, I can agree with that. Yeah. I love the aesthetic and I love the casting. I'm not saying anything bad about any of the actors in Chilling Adventures of Sabrina. You know, this actually makes a valid point of why it is that I'm worried that they're talking about re- making Buffy the Vampire Slayer. That needs to not happen. But it is happening. Oh, fuck. It is fucking happening. And I'm worried that they're going to make it preachy. Yeah, that's that's the problem with Sabrina. It's too damn preachy. They have no sense of nuance. There's there's no subtlety. There's no subtext. It's exactly. like, "Hey, this episode's about challenging gender norms. Let's go." Also, also, my biggest problem with Sabrina was that they bastardized some actual religion. Yes, they do. <laughs> so, just throwing that out there. Yeah. Anyway. I forgot to mention, today we're reviewing Buffy the Vampire Slayer Season 3, Episode 1, entitled Anne. Josh, how about the very first Season 3 mom synopsis? Joshua! <laughs> it's Season 3 already! I can't wait to blame you and everybody else for everything. <laughs> this is going to be excellent. You know how I just expect good things to happen to me and then they do. But you're the entitled one. <laughs> yep, that sounds about right. So what's going on? Did Buffy finally go to hell for all of her sins? Well, despite the fact that her friend Lily thinks that they're in hell... They're, in fact, not in hell. It is kind of a dimensional rift, I guess. So Buffy has run away from home because her mom said some really shitty things to her and she got expelled at the end of the last season closer, leaving Xander and Oz and Willow and Cordelia and Giles to pick up the slack and try 
to control the vampire population of Sunnydale and just get in some good witty banter, but mostly just awkward filler banter, while Xander and Cordelia spend most of the time just being extraordinarily insecure while Buffy is solving a demon crisis that's running a slave circle underground and killing people by making them live uh, really long lives as a slave and then reintroducing them to the population as homeless people. But time moves much faster down there. And yeah, that's about it. Yeah, and then Buffy comes back and hugs Joyce. You know, distance makes the heart grow fonder. Yeah. Is that what you say about me, Joshua? <laughs> <laughs> no, Mom. No. I, I would never. Ladies, gentlemen, spiny headed little creatures. As soon as the sun goes down, 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 down. As soon as the sun goes down, 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 down. Competition is a beautiful thing. Oh, so, season three, episode one opens with a vamp pulling himself out of the ground. And not a speck of dirt on his head. No. But it sounded like it was a schoolmate of theirs because they knew yep. things about him. Anyway. He pulls himself out of the ground. We see and... legs standing in front of the vampire, which I thought was going to be Buffy. Well, the, she's done that before. That exact same camera shot has been done before. Yeah. But no, it's not Buffy. It's Willow. It's Willow. And she tries to kick it off with a badass opening line. <laughs> she said, that's right, big boy. Come and get it. Because I thought it was funny because, well, because Xander takes issue with two things here. So Xander grabs the vampire and then Oz runs up to stake him. But the vampire jumps up and does a double foot kick and then backflips off of Xander pushes Xander into Willow and they fall. Oz tries to do this ridiculous like <laughs> oh it's so great. badass move where he's like trying to throw the stake and hit him from a distance. The soundtrack even expected him to pull it off. <laughs> <laughs> but the vamp goes running, the music plays, he sets up and throws the stake and it looks all badass. He looks like he took time to aim, doesn't even fucking go near the vamp, bounces off a fucking tombstone. It's I thought it was a rock, but whatever it hits was only like 10 feet away and, at most. And he's like, that never works. <laughs> <laughs> Which tells me he has tried that multiple times through the summer. <laughs> he's seen too much Crocodile Dundee. Right? That's the scene this is referencing, I think. I the, think so. The scene where he he's trying to stop this dude that just stole a woman's purse. And he picks up a fallen can from a grocery bag. And waits like a solid 10 seconds for aim. And I'm like, dude, the guy's getting away. And then he whips it. And like, it's a really long fucking throw. It's like the distance of the length of a fucking football field and nails the guy in the head. And it was it was badass. But, you know, that was the 70s. That was fucking Crocodile Dundee that for you. Fucking Crocodile Dundee. He was a fucking badass. But That's not a knife. This is a knife. I see you've played knifey spoony before. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's The Simpsons. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Simpsons did it. Anyway, so Xander takes issue with two things here. The vamp's acrobatic abilities and Willow's line, come and get it, big boy, <laughs> which he misquoted, which is why I got the original quote. Oh, did he misquote he it? He did misquote it. I didn't catch it. that. He said, come and get it, big boy. What's with that or some shit? But what she actually said was, that's right, big boy. Come and get it. Not a big deal. Yeah. It's not a particularly great line but she's trying to be you know the stand-in for buffy yeah neither is the line that oz suggests though either he's like if i may suggest this time it's personal i mean there's a reason why it's a classic i'm like that doesn't even make any sense no, though because it's not personal it's not personal but okay they start talking about how they're worried because tomorrow's the next day of school Apparently, Oz is supposed to have graduated. I have forgotten that he was a grade ahead of them. They didn't even say that he graduated. She was just like, well, you know, I get out around 3 p.m. And, you know, that's like the time that you get up. So and I was like, hey, that's the time I get up. <laughs> right. You shush. I take personal offense to this relatable content. <laughs> so I love the next couple of lines here. Xander's like. I can't wait to see Cordelia. I can't believe I can't wait to see Cordelia. Yeah. 
And then Willow's like, I can't wait to see what homework assignment we get first. And the the look that Xander gives her is just spectacular. And then she says, hey, you're excited over Cordelia, okay? We've all got issues. Yep, aptly She's said. not wrong. Aptly said, definitely. <laughs> yeah, so I was like, so I guess Oz graduated. That's what they're implying. Yep. And then we uh, cut to a dream sequence on the beach. We don't know it's a dream sequence right off the bat, right. but it's pretty obvious, right? Because they're they're basically like, I wonder where I wonder where Buffy is, and the uh, camera's like, these are Sarah Michelle Gellar's boobs, like right, like you guys. <laughs> it focused for a good like three count on her boobs. Check it out, you guys. <laughs> these are Buffy's boobs. <laughs> Rushy, but quit humping her leg. God damn it. Shaggy and Scooby, go home. Damn it, Scoob. <laughs> That's like not cool, bro. You got to ask permission. <laughs> Consent is important. It is very, very important. But she's on the beach. She's looking off into the sunset or sunrise. The The sun's doing something. It's over in there. L.A. So whatever the sun does in L.A. Yeah. <laughs> on the beach. The sun goes down the wrong side. <laughs> I hate California. Anyway. Thank you, Jonathan Colton. Moving along. It's anyway. okay. All of his songs are open source. Oh, they are? They are. I didn't know Literally that. Literally any of his songs. He won't sue you over it because he's a cool fucking guy. So, Angel puts, all of a sudden is there and puts his arms around her. And, you know, it's a very kind of touching romantic scene. But it turns out that she's dreaming. And it, it gets a little creepy there for a second. Well, it's yeah. like, I'll never leave you, Buffy, even if you kill me. Damn it, Buffy. I, <laughs> you don't even know how broody I am, even in death. Buffy. God <laughs> damn it, I'm so broody. <laughs> and he's, and not even, we, he's not even back yet. I mean, no. that we don't know that he's coming <laughs> back. He, if he's We kind of back. do know, because he's still in the fucking opening credits. <laughs> oh, you fucking so the, you meta ruiner. Yeah. Well, no, th- like they ruined it. I I know. I'm I'm just I like to blame people for things that they shouldn't rightfully be blamed for in the spirit of this episode. However, there's an also also another note to the opening credits. Sure. Oz is labeled as a normal cast member this season. Yeah, they changed the opening sequence. New yes. opening sequence, which, you know, is normal for third season, but Oz is a normal cast member, which means we will get way more Oz episodes. Yay! I'm so excited. Insert gif of Kermit going, right here, <laughs> with his arms over his head. You know exactly the one. Exactly the thing that always goes through my head anytime I go, yay! <laughs> also, if you pronounce it gif, that's cool, and I get that, but I hate you and you're wrong. <laughs> We're on the same team. <laughs> so after the opening credits, we go to this fucking diner. A diner. And we meet Anne. And some rednecks that really need to get punched in the face. But, right. But unfortunately never do. Yeah. Yeah. So she serves these guys and one dude is being sleazy verbally at her. And then the other dude slaps her ass. And then the other dude slaps her ass. And we get this night. There's a pause from Buffy where it's like, oh, she's going to turn around and like put his face through the table. But she doesn't. She exercises quite a lot of self-control here. It's quite impressive. And then she walks to another table and meets Ricky and Lily. Lily looks familiar. See, I didn't think she looked familiar at all. But, you know, they obviously hammered at home a couple scenes from now where she was from. Like, hey, just in case you wondered why she looks familiar, here's why. Well, and she even says to Buffy, hey, you look familiar. Do I know you? Mm -hmm. And Buffy, of course, is like, no, you don't fucking know me. I'm Anne. (laughs) Yeah. So they throw down like, I don't know, 38 cents or some shit. And they're like, what can we get with this? And I'm like, even in the 90s, fucking nothing. Are you kidding me? Right. Maybe, no, you could get a cup of coffee. One cup of coffee. (laughs) Because when I was in high school... If they're nice about it. When I was in high school, the local fucking donut shop that was open 24 hours, that was the only fucking place to hang out, 
all fucking night. Yeah. It was 95 cents for one cup of coffee. I don't, dude, I didn't like pause it and zoom in or anything, but it didn't look like that. It, there was even 95 cents there. There was at least a quarter there. Sure. I, it, uh, it looked quarter. like more pennies <laughs> than silver. Right. But and pocket lint. Lots of pocket lint. Plenty of pocket lint. So anyway, they're broke because they got these tandem couple <laughs> yeah. tattoo, which is awful. It's it really so is. awful. It doesn't even look like a heart. It's supposed to look like a heart when they put their arms together. And it doesn't work. It looks like two slabs of meat. <laughs> and they have each other's names on them. Yeah. And Buffy criticizes them because she's like, oh, it's so permanent. Permanency really isn't the issue here. I think the issue here is that half of the tattoo you just paid for is on somebody else. <laughs> Oh, isn't that cute? <laughs> but it's wrong! <laughs> that sounded like a Jim Carrey reference. That's from fucking Ren and Stimpy, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, Ren and Jim Carrey are pretty much the same person, let's be honest. You, right? He sounded like the Grinch. That's what you sounded like just now. I can live with that. But Ren... <laughs> oh, God, we're not going into that again. <laughs> Dig this. Dig this. Sorry, you guys are wet. Fire beheading. Hurry up, sweet dreams. Sunlight. Hurry up, sweet dreams. Cold water. Usual. Oh, yeah. I hit him. With what? A desk. And then comes the most unbelievable breaking of... My ability to to believe in any of the fiction that this fucking show has created. Buffy walks up to her co-worker yeah. and says to her co-worker, I'm not feeling great. Could you cover for me? And the co-worker's like, okay, sure. Yeah, and then sure. she walks off. Not in any fucking <laughs> restaurant that ever happened anywhere ever. It's the most unbelievable fu- Vampires are more believable than this. Yes. Yes, they are. It's like, okay, they might let you off of your shift if you can show us some vomit. Right? If you're vomiting on customers' tables, maybe. Maybe. No they'll moment of, are you sure? They'll probably give you a glass of ice water and begrudgingly sit you down and back. And be like, you know, we're only letting you do this to keep you out of the eyesight of customers. They they will have to make exactly. you feel bad about it first, at least. No small amount of emotional abuse in the restaurant industry. I legitimately had to pause it and be like, what? It's not as bad as the, <laughs> as the blood bank later. Oh, God, But yeah. at least that ends up making sense. <laughs> right. Like, what the fuck is wrong with this restaurant? It must be a front for something. Yeah. Yeah. So then we cut to the library, which begins one of the best fucking camera work scenes that we've had in a while. It's very Aaron Sorkin. They, for three and a half minutes, it's uncut. Is it? Was it uncut? It's from the moment you open on the library to the moment that Cordy and Xander separate and walk off. It is one continual shot. Wow. I didn't even realize. Like, I noticed it was, you know, a really flowing scene, but it did never even occur to me that it was all one long shot. It's all one long shot for Neat. three and a half minutes. It's fantastic. Wow. I appreciate that a lot more than I did now. It also shows that this was actually recorded in a real school. And not on a set. Which means there is a real school with that fucking gorgeous fucking library. Oh. Oh, you might be right. Exactly. Huh. Well, I mean, it could it be an elaborate set that is simply, you know, not constructed for a live okay, audience. Okay, maybe. Maybe. But fucking Christ, it is a beautiful fucking shot. Because I can't imagine that large of a school going completely unused for seven years because they were making a TV show there. No, no, no. They, they, they did record in a real high school, and they recorded in the summer. Did you look this up? Yeah. Oh, neat. Okay, well then I'll just shut up. So, first we start off in the library with this beautiful shot, and... Holy shit, there's students in the library. <laughs> Quite a lot of them. So Willow's talking to Giles. Got one of my quotes of the day here. They're talking about trying to take care of vampires, but yep. one got away and he's like, God forbid something should happen 
or you were killed. I should take it somewhat amiss. And Willow replies, you'd be cranky? He replies entirely. (laughs) Well, we try not to get killed. It's part of our whole mission statement. Don't get killed. That's a good mission statement, I think. I have an important question for you, Josh. Go on. What's our mission statement here at Beer with Buffy? Drink more? Is it get drunk? Beer good, vampire bad. Okay, there we go. Or beer good, Xander bad. We can't go that far. Yeah, I guess. Okay, (laughs) fine. Xander's not all bad. Just after that, Cordy step walks up to talk to Willow. Sure. Cordy complains a little bit about her shitty summer and immediately goes into like being very nervous about seeing Xander. Yeah, she's all super stoked to see Xander again. We find out only a moment later, Xander's all super stoked to see Cordelia again. Well, we kind of already knew that from the opening scene. Oz shows up with a bunch of books in his arms and Willow's like, hey, you came to visit me. And he's like, well, actually, I'm kind of here for me or these books are for me or something. Yeah, remember when I didn't graduate? She's like, what about summer school? Yeah, remember when I didn't go? (laughs) So confirmation that he was supposed to graduate but didn't. And now he is going to repeat the grade. Yeah, whatever, more Oz, cool. Exactly. I love when they do scenes like this where there's like three or four conversations going in tandem and we're just cutting between them, but... With this one long shot, it's just moving from one to the other, and it feels very beautiful and fluid. Yeah, and it's kind of a combination of conversations getting cut off and picking up from where they left off, and other conversations weaving in around them that aren't part of their conversation. So we got Larry talking about how he's excited about the, the new football season or whatever, it's a funny little bit because Cordy is like, how's my hair? And asks Willow that a couple of times. Then Willow talks to Oz and then Xander shows up, is all super nervous about seeing Cordy. And he go, he steps off screen and then quickly bolts back into screen just as Willow's trying to continue her conversation with Oz. And she just kind of snap, snappedly at him goes, your hair is fine. <laughs> The camera steps over to Larry. If we can focus, keep discipline, and not have as many mysterious deaths, Sunnydale is going to (laughs) rule. And I just love the way he delivers that. It's so offhanded, but it's like, they have a very high mortality rate. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he's, he's representing the little people of Sunnydale High. Yep. And it's giving us a little bit of insight to how everybody else is handling the weird shit. And then we cut back to to Oz and Willow, who are having the same conversation. Another good little line from Oz here. They were talking about how Oz was hoping that him having to repeat the grade was cute. And she's like, I'm trying to get to cute. And he says, I can bargain down to eccentric with an option for cool. And then we get the beautiful meeting of Cordy and Xander. Yeah. These two. These four fucking kids <laughs> god damn they're like oh how was your summer fine mine was fine too okay be seeing you that's not the actual quotes but that's the gist of it that was more than i had <laughs> and she's like whatever as xander walks away it's like what the hell you were both super stoked to see each other why didn't you why didn't your faces just connect the second you saw each other and from that beautiful fucking long shot camera work we watch Xander walk off camera and we're hearing the loudness of the school with all the fucking bustling people and it cuts to a solid 15 seconds of silence cuz it cuts to Buffy in her new her shitty apartment as she's just staring off into space well he really timed that out huh because it it was impactful it was very impactful 15 fucking seconds of silence before the fucking music starts up to really hammer in home just how fucking alone she is that's called juxtaposition hey hey boo boo is that what that means I don't actually know what juxtaposition means no I think that actually applies in this situation You want me to Google it real quick? Nah, no need. I'm sure we're right. Yeah, but the outfits suck. This whole rainbow thing is so over. I'm thinking more sporty, like Hilfiger, maybe. (laughs) 
And so we're back in the library all, already, all of a sudden. And Giles has a lead on Buffy's possible location. And Xander is a bit of a Debbie Downer. A bit of a Debbie Downer? Bit of a negative Nancy. A lot. Kind of a douche. Not even kind of. Good douche. Hey, Rex. <laughs> oh, God, I knew this was coming. <laughs> what sound does it make when a salt truck runs into a into a water truck? Douche. Douche. Uh, <laughs> for those of you listening at home, Josh has told that joke hundreds of times in the years that I've known him. What? <laughs> no, uh It's very rare that I tell the joke proper. So that's true. <laughs> uh, back on the city street again, unless you had anything more to say about the <clears throat> library scene. Nope. Um, well, okay. To be a little more specific, Xander's like, I just feel bad because you keep running off and expecting to find Buffy and it keeps being a big old raspberry or some shit. And, and apparently this is like the ninth time that he's had a sketchy lead on a, a girl fighting vampires. Anyway, blah. Back to the city street where Buffy is. We don't really know what city she's it's in. It's in L.A. Somewhere in L.A. Uh, Lily runs up behind Buffy, calling her Anne, but as she suspects, um, she uh, the third time she says, Buffy, and Buffy stops. Yep. And all pretenses are dropped. And this is when we learn that Anne is actually Buffy's middle name. Yeah. Her, bu- her name is Buffy Ann Summers. Yes. Did we not know that before? I don't recall. Uh, I feel like we've heard Joyce call her Buffy Ann Summers. You know, that angry mom voice. That's possible, yeah. That seems likely. But this is when we learn that Lily was in the vampire worshipping cult. Yes. And And she's she's kind of a lost girl. She floats around. She apparently used to be a... Used to hang out with some weird priest and called herself Sister she's got Sunny. She's for cults. Yeah, she's got it definitely. <laughs> uh, she, she's right at home. <laughs> right at home. Um, she used to call herself Chanterelle, and Buffy's like, "That's a mushroom." <laughs> I looked it up. Sure as shit, that is it a is, mushroom. It is a mushroom. Yeah. Lily invites Anne to go to a rave, but. Only if Buffy pays for it, though. <laughs> Specifically says, hey, do you have money? Let's go to a rave. You can pay. <laughs> Practically. But Buffy doesn't want to go and be around people because she's depressed as fuck. Well, I felt like Lily really did have good intentions, and she wasn't trying to be a moocher or a beggar. No, I she completely was, agree. She was like trying to be like, hey, th- I know this really fun thing we can do, but fuck, I don't have any money. But, I mean, if you have money, then I... I just, it'd be really fun to show you, and it felt really purely intentioned, and it, it made me like Lily as a character. Yeah, and it, it definitely, very innocent, naive character. Yes. Purely good intention. And so they're, well, so they're talking about names, and I thought it was important to note that as the second Buffy asks Lily, what do they call you at home, Lily shuts down. Yeah. And we never learn what her actual name is. No. So, yeah, that's that's a huge sign of probable abuse. Oh, yeah. I mean, never mind the fact that she's, you know, hanging out with losers that waste their money on tandem tattoos and then right. and then suggest pie over cake as a healthy alternative, uh, which I'm on board with pie over cake any day of the week. But see, I'm a huge pie fan as well. Yeah. Mostly because my mom has been a cake decorator my whole life. Oh, God, that would do it. <laughs> cake is nothing special to me, my friend. <laughs> but a, a what are you doing, man- Rex? Are you <sighs> eating pie? I have all the cake over here and you eat pie. I don't like cake. <laughs> yeah, it's it's so cakey. And then a homeless man bumps into Lily. <laughs> And she's like, hey, that's rude. And there's something obviously up with this dude. He says he's no one, which is a nod towards another homeless person we saw earlier that we forgot to mention that said she was no one. Yeah. After the 15 seconds of raw silence, an old woman says, I'm no one. But he seems very out of it and he wanders into traffic and Buffy runs and saves him and gets hit by the car instead. Yep. 
And then gets up and shakes it off after a quick commercial break. Right. And everyone's like, oh, are you okay? You're, you're sure you're okay? And she... She's the Slayer. She's fucking fine. Yeah. And probably the only <laughs> useful thing Lily did or said in this entire episode was, I don't think you should be moving right now. And that's just good first aid. Yeah. Like, yeah, you might be in shock. Probably after that fall have some sort of spinal in- injury. But Buffy runs off. Because she's the Slayer and she's fine. Exactly. And then she runs into Ken. This fucking guy. ha <laughs> ha. So bumps into him and he drops all of his stupid flyers. I did not realize that this dude, this actor, was in Buffy. Because this guy also plays a character in the pilot of Firefly. Really? He's the FBI guy hunting uh, Simon and River Tam. Okay. He's a pretty good fucking actor. And he does a really good job of being this super religious-y, kind of creepy dude who's really just trying to help you sort yeah, of Yeah, he really must have been the runner-up for the role of Dexter. Right? Because, and he gets way too personal way too quick. Yeah. He's like, this is a bad place for kids. The despair, it drains them, ends up being the last stop for a lot of them. I've met people like this, though. Yeah. Like, real religious people like this yeah. you need hope hope is a real thing uh yeah or demons it's probably demons <laughs> just saying then we get a few seconds of the episode really hammering home the not so subtle implications that this episode is about runaways and homeless people because it it does some gratuitous like, look at these homeless people sitting in oh, the streets. Oh, the montage of the young beggars. Oh, my yep. God, that was sad. And I don't mean sad in the way that they intended it to be. I was like... I, the thing is, is it's just not subtle. They didn't need it to hammer home the point that they're trying to make here. Yeah. Well, especially with all of them being, you know, kidnapped into slavery in this town... How are there that many young beggars on the streets in this town? But whatever. We'll get to that point later. I'm dating. I am having serious dating with a werewolf. And I'm studying witchcraft and and killing vampires. It's like a drug. Cutting to... The the Bronze. Bam. So... I was surprised that this was not a musician that I had heard of before because I looked her up. The band is called Belly Love and they're an alt rock band in LA still active. I thought they had a pretty good sound. But yeah, they they had a they have fucking great sound. But Xander's and- all like, "God, glad we showed up <laughs> for a depressing night at the Bronze." And I'm like, "I mean, actually, you know, that shitty city that Buffy's in is really making me appreciate Sunnydale. Right? Like, they definitely take the bronze for granted. That's easily the best thing about that city. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Especially because they get some really good fucking musicians there they for re- being a, off in the distance. Never mind how much of a naysayer Xander is this, like, whole episode. Yeah. But, so, Xander and Willow, Xander is being parent. He's, he's all paranoid that... Cordelia's off bragging about some imaginary affair. I don't know why he's just assuming that she's fucking around on him. They're dumbasses. Him and Cordy. Both fucking dumbasses. Complete dumbasses. They're perfect for each other. This is the moment where I, I it should definitely be brought up that they must have not talked to each other at all the entire fucking summer. Not only that, but they didn't discuss it at all before she went away for the summer. Yeah. What the hell is wrong with these two fuckers? Well, no cell phones. And I think she's obviously a bit more well off than he is. And, you know, her parents were probably like, all right, get in the car. You're going off on this summer thing. You're going to have so much fun. This whole episode uh, really well demonstrates how people who appear strong are actually just really insecure. Yes. 
Definitely. And that's what's going on here is they're both just letting their imaginations run away with them as a defense mechanism to protect their emotions. And wholly failing to communicate at all in their relationship. Yeah, that too. You know, they're high schoolers. But we do get a good little line here uh, from a conversation between Oz and Xander. So they Oz walks up, they're talking about the slaying. And Oz Xander is, says the slaying isn't getting any easier either. And Oz says, I think I think we're really getting a rhythm down. Yeah, but we're losing half the vamps. Yeah. But rhythmically. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but then Xander gets a good idea and he sees Cordy walk in and he's like, You know what we need? And Cordy's looking pretty fine. Is bait. Oh yeah. <laughs> need some Cordy bait. I know what'll bring us back together. If I get Cordelia involved in the Scooby happenings. Yes. And he wasn't wrong. No, he's not wrong. So cut to Buffy's house. Joyce is writing checks. And then she just... So there's a knock at the door. And she just swings it open like the town isn't fucking filled with vampires and demons posing as salesmen. What the fuck is this? The 80s? For fuck's sake. <laughs> Good call back there. God damn. But it's Giles. Yeah. So... And Giles shows up to let her know that he followed up on a lead, but it didn't pan out like we expected it not to. Well, I I really thought that this was going to be the time that it did pan out and he was going to show up and be like, Buffy, you have to come home. But that didn't happen. Yeah. Oh, well. Turns out. Yeah, because it turns out it was just a bunch of bunch of goth kids listening to shitty music. Yeah. And there were no vampires. <laughs> he goes... It didn't pan out, and she's like, what, no buffings, no vampires. No vampires. <laughs> <laughs> but I like that he didn't find her, and that she comes back on her own accord. Yeah, I think no. that, that's way better for her character. That was definitely a much better move for this episode to pan out. Definitely, I agree. So Joyce is all like, oh, the last thing we did was fight, and Jaws is like, you mustn't blame yourself for her leaving. So Joyce says, I don't. I blame you. You've been this huge influence on her, guiding her. How dare you, Giles? How dare you guide her daughter? Sorry, I'm not going to be able to get through this whole line without just erupting throughout. So carry uh, on because I'm right there with you, bud. You had this whole relationship with her behind my back because God forbid my daughter do anything without me being 18 miles up her ass. Holy shit, give your daughter some fucking privacy. Also, you know about her being the Slayer, and does she know that he's the Watcher? Yeah. Apparently, they had to have had this conversation by now, because he's openly talking about vampires with her. Anyway, so she finishes off with saying, I feel like you've taken her away from me. Shut the fuck up, Joyce! You drove her away! <sighs> Take a deep breath. No, no, short, shallow breaths. <laughs> No, deep breath, Joshua. Hyperventilate. <laughs> yeah. Just like I can't have you passing out on me now. <laughs> <laughs> Quick, I need something heavy to pick up. Pick it up in a swift, jerking, twisting motion. It's the proper way to lift things, right? Come on, Rex. Think back to our Lamaz courses. I never took any Lamaz courses. Well, I was never pregnant with your baby either, so I guess that makes us even. Sometimes you confuse me and worry me a great deal. Only sometimes? More often than not, I suppose. I guess my work here is not done. Uh, so, Childs has a good response. Not perfect, but good. Uh, it's probably because Giles is a better person than I will ever be. Yeah, no shit. And also, he's English. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's way more polite in general as a baseline than we could ever be because we're fucking American. Yeah. I'd have <laughs> been like, Joyce, follow me. So you see this hole that you're digging now at gunpoint. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That escalated quickly. <laughs> it really did. <laughs> anyway, Giles is lying. He says, I didn't make her who she is. 
Joyce responds with, and who exactly is she? And he doesn't say, she's the fucking Slayer. No, it cuts before he responds. So like he's how- about to respond, and then it cuts scene. We don't ever actually see his response. We never see how this conversation finishes. That pissed me the fuck off. That was really annoying. We got, like... 10 minutes of backstory on Lily, but we didn't get the rest of this scene. I really wanted to see him truly rip into her mm. the way he w- he would. Oh, yes. He would rip into her. He, that's why he's the ripper. I wanted to see him open up Joyce's asshole, <laughs> step inside, and close the door behind him. Are we at a rate where that has been brought up every episode now? For several episodes now. <laughs> I, I'm fine with that being in every episode from here on out, frankly. Yes, it's time to listen. The good guys are always stone walls and true. The bad guys are easily distinguished by their pointy horns or black hats. We always defeat them and save the day. No one ever dies and everybody lives happily ever after. Liar. So then we cut to the diner. Yeah, Lily wants Buffy's help, and she's being very Anne about it. Doesn't want to get involved. So, yeah, so Lily's all um, upset because she can't find Ricky. And, you know, that's fair because they obviously were connected at the hip. I was surprised that she was out talking to Buffy alone. Right. Frankly. Right. And Buffy won't help, which is very out of character for her, but she clearly just can't say no. But the look in her eyes, though, she was like, you are so pathetically helpless right now that it makes me angry for all of womankind. (laughs) Right. Was the look in her face. And she was like, oh, for fuck's sake, I'm going to teach you a lesson, girl. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Because, Lily, you look up helpless and naive in the fucking dictionary. And there's Lily right there staring you in the face. Mm-hmm. So they go to the blood bank. Her and Ricky go there a lot. And it, it was a, a nice logical place to look. Yeah. Um, now, first off, it should not be a blood bank. It should be a plasma plasma place. domain. Plasma donation center because would have been more accurate. You can't actually make money donating blood, but you can make money donating plasma. I should know. I did it for a year and a half. I mean, who's to say that the blood bank doesn't also do plasma? Oh, okay, I'll, I'll give you that one. Anyway, so four issues with this nurse. A, way too polite. B, way too eager to help. C, way too knowledgeable. D, Hey, let me give away confidential patient information. HIPAA! Fucking HIPAA! Fucking HIPAA! Holy shit! And let me get it for you quickly, for free! You can't do that! No, you fucking can't! <laughs> yeah, that shit is no joke. Definitely. Yeah, so holy shit, so that, that is a very good fucking point. Like, what the fuck is wrong with this nurse? Yeah. Lots or of Or phlebotomist, things. or whatever she is. So... I do have to mention, though, in this scene, I wrote down the fucking time because I was laughing my ass off at it. Sure. 21 minutes and 41 seconds into the episode, they're talking to the nurse lady, and just as the nurse lady turns around to go check their records to see if Ricky has been there, you hear someone in the background go, Ow! <laughs> <laughs> and it is way louder than it should be. <laughs> and it is just fucking hilarious. I to didn't me. notice that. That's amazing. You really have to like go back and watch that part of the episode just to hear that and you'll laugh your ass off. Okay. So uh Buffy suggests that her and Lily split up <laughs> to go and and Lily's like, Can I come with you? What part of splitting up aren't you getting? Lily is just not very bright. Not very bright. She's a bit of a ditz. That's okay. She's cute. Um, seriously, though, the way those pants hung around her waist, that was really doing it for me. Just saying. Um, <laughs> so, anyway, as they leave, we the, <laughs> the music and the camera shot and the look on the nurse's face clearly establishes that She's evil. And I'm like, oh, thank God. I thought she was just a terrible actress 
dealing with, <laughs> dealing with really shitty lines for a moment, but thank God she's evil. Okay. So then it cuts to a nighttime bit where Buffy is looking through like some squatter places, I guess. Yeah, I I figured it was just some alleyway slums where bums are wont to sleep. And she finds the homeless guy that she saved from traffic. Has It looks like he's committed suicide by drinking a bottle of Drano. That sounds unpleasant. That sounds really unpleasant. That's like got to be the worst way to go. Yeah, but it turns out it's Ricky. It tastes like burning. Glass tastes like blood. Excellent. <laughs> Officially the only voice I can do well. That's because it's just basic falsetto, but good. I'm happy for you. So, <laughs> But yeah, the homeless dude that committed suicide is Ricky because he has the fucking Lily half heart tattoo on his arm. Yep. So it's definitely Ricky. And so Buffy runs back to her apartment and she's trying to explain to Lily why it's Ricky and, and tells her everything except for the part about the tattoo. Like, you, you know, the one thing that would have made it perfectly apparent to Lily. Like, hey, I found an old homeless man dead who had Ricky's tattoo with the other half of your fucking tattoo absolutely undeniable mark of what is identity wrong with all these people and their inability to communicate yeah seriously though no. but obviously Lily blames Buffy because everyone's blaming the wrong people in this episode just before Lily runs out, she's like, you said you donated blood a lot, right? Maybe they're doing something with the blood that's causing people to age. As she correctly assumes it's the demon Mormons are sucking the proverbial soul marrow of the town. Duh. I mean. Um, uh, pretty obvious when you think about it. Pretty obvious, really. <laughs> but Lily runs out and runs into Ken. Oh, fucking Ken is so creepy. Yeah, he is. He's definitely one of the creepiest bad guys we've seen yet. Yeah. Uh, and then we go to the blood bank at night, and Buffy does some B&E. <laughs> I fucking love this scene. I love it so much. Yeah, did you get her quote when the nurse... I, I did. Dude. I got the whole thing. Okay, you The whole ahead. conversation. All right, so, so the nurse she, says, what are you doing? She says, breaking into your office and going through your private files. And she's like, I'm calling the police. And Buffy just reaches over and rips the phone off the wall. <laughs> Pretty much bats it like a cat knocking a glass off a table. So what does candidate mean? <laughs> yeah, because Ricky's file had the word candidate written in the comments section, but yep. it doesn't say for what. And we find out that candidate means apparently Ken is, I guess, paying this nurse woman to screen blood donors for healthy candidates. Oh, I have another Buffy quote. Uh, so right the nurse ahead. says, you're going to be in a whole lot of trouble. And Buffy says, I don't want trouble. I just want to be alone in a room with a chair and a fireplace and a tea cozy. I don't even know what a tea cozy is, but I want one. <laughs> Instead, I keep getting trouble, which I am more than willing to share. I, I just really loved the part about the tea cozy. Yeah. I don't, I even, don't know. even know what a tea cozy is, but, but I, I want, want one. one. <laughs> she got really angry when what she said that. What is a tea cozy, actually? I don't actually know what a tea cozy is. It's literally exactly what it sounds like. It's a... It, they're normally crocheted, but, you know, you can buy them pre-made. It's just a like a sweater for a teapot. Oh. Yeah. See, I was thinking it was like a crocheted um, coaster kind of thing. I don't know. That might have something to do with it. But no, it's for bored people that don't have cats to put sweaters on. Oh. Or people that have gotten tired of putting sweaters on their cats. So Maybe they have too many cat sweaters. So they start putting them on inanimate objects instead. This this makes me think how impossible it would be to get a fucking sweater on my cat. Also, I'm probably completely wrong. Give us a call. Let us know. <laughs> what the fuck is a tea cozy? 269-743-0783. Okay, thanks. Bye. Are tea cozies British things? Prob oh, God, it would have to be. Okay. We have a lot of London listeners. We do have a fair amount. Yes. We've actually gotten more specific responses from uh, listeners in the UK than any other fucking country. We have. Absolutely. Thank you, Great Britain. <laughs> we love you. And God, if we could afford to come over there and just hang out, we fucking would. Yes. We like it better than our country. 
<laughs> no comment. <laughs> We're not getting into that. <laughs> they say young people don't learn anything in high school nowadays, but um, I've learned to be a friend. So what was the uh, story about that alligator? So I really wanted Buffy to punch that nurse in the face a yeah. lot. <laughs> She's like, oh, I just complicitly give away pr- confidential information to right. these people. I'm not doing anything wrong. Yeah, wow, you and Joyce would get along great. Cut to the Mormon den. Lily is the sheepest sheeple that ever sheeped. <laughs> because everything about her screams indoctrinate me sheeple 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 yeah that's her theme song <laughs> that's lily to a t sheeple Great sheeple, impersonation. sheeple sheep 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 <laughs> so she she runs into what's his tits on the on the street a uh, dexter junior here and uh, he immediately talks her into going into the family home place because that's where Ricky is. Hey, did you know your boyfriend's still alive? Come on down and get yourself a free cleansing. He's convinced her that it's kind of like a baptism and she just fucking goes with it. Just laps it right up. So cut back to Sunnydale Park where they are setting up Cordelia as bait. Yep. Cordy, and Cordy's all like, what's the plan? Xander's like, well, the vampire attacks you. And then what? All oh, the vampire kills you. We watch. We rejoice. <laughs> <laughs> and then she really lays into him. Everything's a joke with you. No, just our relationship. Hold on. Before that, though, they're all going to hide and she starts following Xander and she's like, where do I hide? And he, he says, you don't hide. You're bait. Go get Beatty. Go be Beatty. Yeah. But yeah, Cordy and Xander are arguing. And then we see uh, the vamp that they're hunting is eyeballing Willow, but Willow doesn't see him. Yeah. He's sneaking up behind Willow. And then we cut back to family home. Back to the Mormon den. And sorry, Mormons, but he really seems like a Mormon to me. No, he does. I, 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 I just know that the Mormons are really stout people and very difficult to offend. So... I'm just going to keep calling him a Mormon. How watching Lily especially go through these steps of of following what Ken wants her to do with kneeling in front of the pool and getting ready for the cleansing. Sure. How is she still alive? Hmm. That woman should be dead. Why? Because literally anybody can walk up to her and be like, here, follow me. I have candy for you. <laughs> yeah. Hey, why don't you step into this rusty van full of cheese sandwiches? And she'll be like, cheese sandwiches? I love cheese sandwiches. I love me some cheese sandwiches. I love cheddar. I love Gouda. How is she alive? <laughs> <laughs> Pepper Jack, Swiss. And this is officially like the third or fourth cult that she's been part of. Mm-hmm. But we cut to Buffy trying to talk her way in, in her best subtle undercover, undercover, best, <laughs> best subtle undercover Buffiness. No, you had it right the first time. Undercover. <laughs> She's not good at this. <laughs> She's about as good at this as you are at saying things. <laughs> Fuck so, you. Do, you. Do you have the quote? <laughs> No, I didn't actually write down the quote. So she's she's talking to these guys that look a lot like Ken, actually. Yeah. And she says, hey, I woke up this morning and I'm like, hey, what's with all the sin? <laughs> <laughs> what's with that? <laughs> <laughs> so what's with all the sin? I need to change. I'm dirty. I'm bad with the sex and the envy and that loud music that us kids listen to nowadays. <laughs> oh, I just suck it undercover. Where's Ken? And she kicks open the door and she beats the fuck out of him and runs in just in time to see Lily fall into the black goop. Yep. She goes to grab Lily. Ken grabs a hold of her and then she just kind of throws them both into the black goop. Yep. Which isn't goop and it isn't liquid. 
It's a portal to another dimension. Correct. Another dimension. Another dimension. Another dimension. I don't know what you're quoting. It's Be- Beastie Boys. Oh, I knew that. Except for the part where I did not know that. So. Jeez. Uncultured swine. <laughs> Yes, I am. Thank you for noticing. And Ken loses his face because he's a demon. So, yeah, you know, just putting to rest any doubts that we might have had. It's the Mormons, as I suspected. (laughs) And they're running a slave den. So uh, Ken pulls off his weird human face to reveal himself as a Mormon. He's like, oh, do you have any idea how hard that is to glue on? Yeah. Very goopy mask, by the way. Yeah, I didn't... I, I. he must have a lot of mucus buildup under between the the face. Yeah, and between the fake mask and his real skin, because the other demons weren't that goopy. No, and he's not goopy the rest of the the episode. No, no, he like he goes and wipes that off, and yeah, huh? Yeah, it must be some weird demon glue. But he shows them that they're in some like factory hell dimension yeah i mean it looks like a steel mill to me and there's people just you know banging hammers on anvils they're not actually blacksmithing anything no they're just hitting anvils just banging on anvils is that a thing no i don't think that's, that's a thing it really that, isn't a that thing. needs to be done it's so maybe they're trying to flatten the ends of the hammer Sure. I, <laughs> so they're so they're in the Temple of Doom. <laughs> yeah. No, exactly that. Yeah, Temple of Doom light. Uh but Ken's like, Welcome to my world. Hope you like it. Knocks Buffy out. You're never leaving. Commercial break. And then we cut back to the graveyard. Well, it's it's the park actually. They're not they're not in are oh, they? Oh right. No, you're right, they're in the park. I annotated it wrong. They're trying to lure in this vampire that they lost at the beginning of the episode. How they knew they, that he would be in the park, who knows? And so they're both just... As- Xander and Cordy are both just assuming that the other cheated on them over the summertime because they're both super insecure high school teenagers. Willow gets attacked. They run to help. Oz runs to her aid and gets flung behind the vampire like a rag doll. Like a rag doll. <laughs> yeah. Xander steps in and he's holding his own like he does because he may be an asshole, but he's a bit brawnier than Oz. Oh, yeah. What can I well, say? He's also just fucking twice Oz's size. Yeah, he's a big guy. My favorite part here is that Cordy like tries to jump on the vamp's back because she wants to help, I guess. And thank, thank God that the fucking steak disappears sometimes when you stake a vampire. <laughs> Yeah. Because she would be impaled. That would be problematic at best. <laughs> Absolutely. Xander falls back. The vampire falls on top of him. And she falls on the vamp. And Xander happens to be holding the stake at the right spot in between him and the vampire. And the vampire is staked and dusts. And this is the second time he's accidentally staked a vampire. Yeah. And as far as we know, really... Okay, this might be the third time he's staked a vampire. I feel like there was another time yeah. where he did it on purpose. There was one time I think he did it on purpose. Hmm. I don't recall But winning. yeah, luckily the stake disappears, so Cordy is not impaled, and they can make out instead. And they make out like fucking fiends. Like, like they should have the moment they first fucking saw each other. Yeah, it's like, thank God the tension was really starting to piss me off. So back to the Temple of Doom. We should figure out what kind of deal this is. I mean, is it a gathering, a shindig? gathering is brie mellow song stylings shindig dip less mellow song stylings perhaps a large amount of malt beverage and hoot nanny well, chock full of hoot just a little bit of nanny lily thinks they are literally in hell which they might as well be i have a question is this the opposite of barbie world from the the song i'm just a barbie girl in a barbie world how is it the opposite because it's pun? Ken's world. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> he said it's my world. His name's Ken. Yeah, you're right. If this demon dimension hell is like the opposite of Barbie girl in a Barbie world, then this would be Marilyn Manson's sweet dreams are made of these. Or no, no. It's if Marilyn Manson covered Barbie world. Y- yeah, or that. There we go. There it is. So this is when Ken explains that 
time travel or time passes differently here in Ken's world than it does in the real world. Yeah, so we we finally find out how the the people are getting old. I crunched the numbers. Okay. So they bring in a dozen people and in one day of earth time those 12 people grow old and die. That means that they have to abduct 11,000 people a year. Yeah, that's like the Bermuda Triangle. <laughs> huh. Like, there's no way there's that many homeless people around. Yeah. But what I particularly find interesting is that means that for any length of time that Ken is in the real world, that's like a hundred fucking years pass back in his hometown. I hope he has good lower management. <laughs> yeah, seriously. All he has to do is step back into Earth for like 30 seconds and everybody's like, oh, Ken's been gone for years. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He better have good management staff. <laughs> but so, yeah, in a generic villain speech otherwise. Yep. So Lily and Buffy get pushed in with this other group of people who are being indoctrinated by the demons. The Dude, the demon they had, like telling them what to do and like yelling at him and beating on him and everything was way more badass than Ken looked. Oh yeah. No, he was fucking terrifying. But you know, you'd you'd have to be to be a permanent slave driver. That sounds just as awful as being a slave for an eternity. Yeah. I mean, okay, not as awful cuz but still, like that's all your time. That's all you do. That's yeah. just, that's as bad as working in a factory. They're, they're just well, as I mean, much he is slaves. working in a factory. They're just as much slaves as the slaves are. Yeah. And yeah, he is working in a factory. So I love this bit because he's like telling them how it will be, how they're going to live there and die there. And he looks to one person. He's like, you're no one. What is your name? And he's like, uh, Alex. I thought he said Aaron or whatever. Well, Doesn't yeah. matter. And he beats him. And then he goes to the next one. He's like, what is your name? Or who are you? Or whatever. And they're and like, like, I'm no one. I'm no one. And, but he gets to Buffy. And then he's like, who are you? And she's like, I'm Buffy, the vampire slayer. <laughs> All super cheery and everything. And then proceeds to kick his ass. Yeah. And big raucous fight scene breaks out. It's fairly enjoyable. Uh, we get from this fight scene one of the most iconic Buffy action sequences that we will never, ever stop seeing in any preview flashback or opening sequence of Buffy the Vampire Slayer that yep. we ever see again, which is where she's got that triangular knife weapon thingy. Like cool axe ass thing that she uses. And, and we get fucking that, badass. Exactly. And then we get that in the round uh, camera shot of her. That makes yep. her look super badass. It's an amazing sequence. This whole set is fantastic. Yeah, it's it's really well done. Um, I don't know where they find these uh, these warehouses that like this could not have been a real warehouse. This well, this was definitely no. This was definitely a sound set, and I'm I'm saying that because of a point I'll make later. Okay. But yeah, we get one hell of a great fight scene here. Yeah, she puts Lily in charge of being the leading all of these other people out. And I'm like, okay, I I know she needs the confidence booster, but is this really a good time for that? It I'd really have gone, isn't. I'd have chosen Aaron, personally. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Granted, he did just get the fuck beat out of him. You know, he's still more qualified than Lily. <laughs> probably. He could be about to die and probably still be more qualified than Lily. Yeah. So Buffy's fighting some demons, and Ken is up there like, humans don't fight back. That's how this works. Meh. I'm so whiny. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. But the axe-like weapon that she steals from one of the guards and then throws into another guard, it's just so awesome. Yeah. The whole fucking sequence of her fighting off... Pretty much half a dozen guards or more. It was pretty satisfying. It was 
excellent. Especially she's on a raised, raised platform. She keeps knocking them off the platform. They keep having to climb back onto the platform. It's it's fantastic. And they're clearly just not prepared and not accustomed to being attacked, especially by competent fighters. Oh, exactly. Yeah, they're used to, you know, piddly, you know, normal mortal kids that are like, oh, don't hit me, sir. I, nah. I just got out of my day retail job and I came here. And... <laughs> Dig this. Dig this. Sorry, you has a weight. Fire beheading. Hurry up, sweet dreams. Sunlight. Hurry up, sweet dreams. And water. Usual. Oh, yeah. I hit him. With what? A desk. So Lily is running off with the other people that are trying to escape. And Ken ends up grabbing her. Drags her back to the main room. They're up on the the platform that Ken originally introduced Lily and Buffy to this world. Yeah, he's trying to make an example out of Lily. He goes, you got guts. I think I'd like to slit you open and play with them. (laughs) That escalated quickly. Lily. I, I like where he went with that. I wasn't expecting that. Right. Have you ever played Worms Armageddon? No. One of my favorite games of all time. Sure. But my favorite way to kill someone in worms is the prod attack. Where you have one worm inch its way and they make this noise as they fucking inch their way across the fucking map and walk up to another bad guy worm and the prod attack is you just bloop and push him (laughs) off the edge. And that's what Lily does to Ken. Yeah. She just is watching him rant and then goes, whoops. I'll show you the price of rebellion. Ah, no, you're not supposed to do that. I don't like that. Oh, no. Thus illustrating why in the real world on Earth, we have OSHA. <laughs> yeah. Because they there was no railing. No hand railing. We have learned from this episode that OSHA <laughs> does not exist in hell. Nope. <laughs> or at least in hell-like dimensions. Right. So the the fight resumes. Buffy takes her cue. Yep. And she starts whooping some demon ass some, some more. They were, like you said, wholly unprepared for someone of Buffy's caliber. Absolutely. So Buffy meets up with the, uh, the other lost kids. Yep. And she lifts the gate... <laughs> I really love her commentary while she's doing this. It is fantastic. She's like, I hope this works. The abs and the glutes. Oh, God, I'm going to feel this for a week. It's like, damn, Buffy, <laughs> lift with your legs. <laughs> hey, the glutes are part of the legs. Uh, no, I'm aware, but she did not lift that in a way that was remotely okay. Yeah. You're going to you're gonna fuck up your back. I don't think those rules apply to the Slayer. So Ken runs up behind her just as she's sliding under the gate. And I really thought she was going to get stabbed by the gate. But luckily, it stabs Ken instead. Right leaving through his legs. Through his leg. I thought it was his oh back, God. but it, they show it clearly. It's his... Oh, my God. Right in the calf. It's gruesome. And then probably one of my favorite lines ever in this series coming up. So she walks up to Ken and she's holding this like club or axe or whatever it is. And she says, hey, Ken, want to see my impression of Gandhi? (laughs) Just splatters his head everywhere. You know, they don't really show the gore. But then like a watermelon, like a fucking watermelon (laughs) at a Gallagher show. (laughs) And Lily comes up and she's like, Gandhi? Well, you know. If he was really pissed off. (laughs) I was really expecting the line to be, I never said it was a good impression of Gandhi. (laughs) That would have been really good. That would have been a better joke, actually. Back to the apartment. Yep. Buffy. Oh, (laughs) another fun quote here. Buffy's like, she's talking to Lily. She's like, let me give you the tour. (laughs) This concludes our tour. I have lived in that apartment where the tour is a long pause. (laughs) My last apartment was about that. Or a short pause for that matter. Right. (laughs) But no, Buffy gives Lily the apartment. It has three weeks of rent paid and even has a job lined up in her place in the diner. Yeah, Buffy pretty much just hands over her entire life 
her she, an identity her an identity yes that she's made for herself in the short few months that she's been away from home i'm kind of sad that i don't recall there being any sort of follow-up on lily from here yeah buffy says she'll call but you know she doesn't nobody ever calls when they say they'll call yeah anyway <laughs> lily's like i'm not good at taking care of myself and buffy's like it gets easier and i'm like no it doesn't it really doesn't that's not true at all don't lie buffy <laughs> cut back to buffy's house buffy's like i have a tv show to get back to starring in excuse me joyce is like i'm not done blaming everybody but myself for literally everything because she just expects good things to happen to her because she's an entitled baby boomer and then buffy comes home and they hug and i'm yeah, I'm not sure why um, Buffy just takes her back like that. You know, absence makes the heart grow fonder. What are you going to do? Yeah. Anything else to add to that? Grr fucking arg. Grr arg. Is this for me? I must be ready. I need my strength. strength. Give, give, give me more! Night, I shall walk in the arc. You've got something in your eye. How did you feel about this episode? Hmm. Hmm. No, sir. I don't like it. So when I saw the ep- what episode it was, I remembered it. Yeah. And I remembered n- really not liking it. Yeah. It was better than I remembered. Yeah. But I don't think I liked the episode. I felt like it was unnecessarily awkward and Xander and Cordelia were being super self-conscious yep. like you do, you know, is their first real relationship and you, you get self-conscious about those kinds of things. But I felt like the show itself became self-conscious in an awkward kind of way. Like they were trying too hard with the witty banter and nothing really struck my funny bone until towards the end. And I was just like, huh, ah, okay, Buffy style banter. That's cute, I guess. Like a lot of things that Willow said and Giles and Oz and Xander, to- especially in that opening sequence, felt like they were really just trying too hard to have that Joss Whedon style witty banter. And it it just irked me. I was like, okay, guys, just let it happen. Stop being, stop trying too hard. Right. I think what this episode suffers from is it wasn't till like season five and six that the creators of the show were afraid that the the show was going to be canceled at any fucking moment. Yeah. So I think it suffers from that mentality because the minute they're they're like oh we're still on we better really well reestablish what we are and they're trying too hard to to go strongly into the new season that would absolutely ramp up anyone's anxiety knowing that there's suits breathing down their necks ready to axe them at any point in time absolutely and you know it's it's a valid fucking stance because they were a uh underdog show that came in for a half a first season Uh and somehow they were still on the air and that's impressive so yeah i can i can see them definitely trying too hard from that yeah but for the for the most part uh I, i just it wasn't a very substantial episode either outside of the dialogue though Especially a lot of the dialogue in the first half. Well, especially all the dialogue from the Scoobies. Yeah. Without Buffy and the Scoobies, the dynamic just doesn't feel right. There was a lot of filler, but, you know, considering there's 22 episodes in the series, and on average, we're only seeing maybe, uh, or in the season, I mean, and on average, we're only seeing 10 episodes per season these days in the in the golden age of Netflix and Hulu. Yeah. And we're seeing much more movie quality productions. Every episode is jam packed full of 10 to 20 real plot events going down. Right. Whereas the only real plot event that happened in this was Buffy realized how good she has it at home and she misses her friends and family and she really does care about her her own identity. Now, 
poor dialogue choices for some of it aside, one thing that is just amazing in this episode is the fucking cinematography. It was good. Oh my god, they pulled out all the fucking stops for the cinematography. I the lighting was fucking amazing. Yeah. The the camera work was just blew me away, well, especially they, the the three and a half minutes of uncut. And they wanted to come back into season three with a bang, and they clearly needed to impress somebody to make sure that they stayed on the air. And I'm glad that they did what they needed to do. Yep. And they kept the show on the air. And that makes this episode totally worthwhile. I you know, I think we just we get a little too spoiled and we expect a little too much. Like the episode delivered in the long run. Yeah. You know, we had some bad guys. Uh, we had all our characters that we know and love. And even when they have bad chemistry, they still have better chemistry than a lot of fucking characters. Yeah. Out there on other TV shows. Unquestionably. So, you know, that's a good. This episode was not great, but still a win. Yeah. I'm on board. And I'm going to say Larry's quote (laughs) is my quote of the day. Okay. For a couple of reasons here. One, I love it when they have a fucking random side character who we don't see very often say something particularly funny and clever. But also... I just like the fact that it really showcases how much more aware the populace of Sunnydale is of the weirdness going on at all times. Mm -hmm. And that makes me happy. Also, it's just really a good fucking subtle delivery from someone who's honestly probably a better actor than his bit role really gives him credit. Yeah. I'm surprised that Larry is still coming back every time he's on screen. I'm like, wow. That one-off character is still around. He he wasn't a one-off character in, anymore at this point. I think we have to give him the credit that he's due. Yeah, as exactly a, as a regular recurring character on this series. He's one of the most recurring characters. Yeah, more than Harmony even at this point. Yeah, definitely. So, what's your quote of the day? I think I'm gonna go with Buffy's line. I don't want trouble. I just want to be alone in a room with a chair and a fireplace and a tea cozy. I don't even know what a tea cozy is, but I want one. I think we also have to have an honorable mention for her Gandhi impression. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. How did that go again? Hey, want to see my impression of Gandhi? (laughs) Well, you know, if he was really pissed off. (laughs) Yeah, no, that was amazing. Definitely. So this has been Beer with Buffy. Like, subscribe, most importantly, review us on iTunes. You can find us on Patreon. Help us keep the show going. Help us hit the goal of being able to bring in Ale with Angel. As always, thank you to our fabulous composer, Ben Alexander. Also, welcome to the show, music by Reggie Page. This has been Beer with Buffy. I'm Rex. I'm Josh. Have a good night. (laughs) You are the slayer. Lives depend upon you. I make allowances for you, yes, but I expect a certain amount of responsibility, and instead of which you enslave yourself to this this cult. You don't like the color? (laughs) You have a sacred birthright. You were chosen to destroy vampires, not to wave pom-poms at people. Why can't you people just leave me alone? You are the flare. Go ahead. Let's go. Let's go. I'm a watcher. I, I haven't the skill. Oh, come on. By appealing, by appealing to your common sense. Common sense. Common sense. What? Everything you've ever dreaded was under your bed, but told yourself couldn't be by the light of day. One girl in all the world. Common sense. One girl in all the world. Common sense. It was a bit, um, British, wasn't it? Wee! Wait, what have we done?
why are we watching this? 